Part of the problem with immigration is that we have a very difficult time understanding the relationship between us and the immigrant, and that relationship is a historical relationship for us here in the United States. That relationship begins when we defined the border of the United States, and as we went through the process of defining the geographical territory of the United States. You're gonna to have to go back to 1848, when the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo was signed after the war between the United States and Mexico, a war that resulted in the United States taking from Mexico what are now the states of California, New Mexico, Arizona, Utah, Nevada. That treaty also established the boundary between the United States and Mexico to be the Rio Grande, and that was also the time at which Texas joined the Union. If you look at that treaty, there isn't a credible historian today that is going to say to you that that war was about anything other than the United States fulfilling its own vision of being a country that went from the Atlantic Ocean to the Pacific Ocean. It just so happened that there was this chunk of land that was owned by Mexico that stood in the way. And so the process was to take it and make it part of the United States. And that is in fact what happened a few years later, the land transition was completed through the Gaston Purchase that was settled in 1853 when the remaining piece of land was paid for to Mexico so that we could keep the territory intact. Shortly after the war with Mexico, the United States got caught internally in trying to resolve an issue that has many parallels to today as we look at immigration. And that issue was the Civil War. A process and an experience that took the life of over one million of us. One million US citizens died to settle one question. Is it going to be acceptable for us to own another human being? And I promise you, there was a lot of analysis and there was a lot of statistics. There was a lot of people that said, here are the economic benefits of slavery and here are the economic benefits of not having slavery. Today, we are all giving out all kinds of statistics about immigration, why? We should or shouldn't do this about immigration. It was the same leading up to the Civil War. But in the end, the issue wasn't one of statistics and economics. It was about definition. And it took a million US lives to say, we want to be defined as a people who categorically say one human being may not own another human being. After the Civil War, and the nation more or less settled down, we got busy with the business of beginning to develop the country. And that busyness included connecting the country from the East Coast to the West Coast, the railroad. It included beginning to do the mining of the resources of a very wealthy resource nation. It also included beginning to develop the agricultural lands of the United States, the agricultural industry. The desire to connect the railroad, to begin mining minerals and resources, to begin taking advantage of agriculture required labor that we did not have, and so we saw the first appeal to immigrants to come into the US to help in these three major industries. In fact, many people from China were brought in to help build the railroad from the east to the west part of the United States. 
they were here because we gave them the job of helping to build the railroad. And God only knows how many people from China lost their lives in the work of building that railroad. Come the beginning of the 1880s, we begin to see the first backlash. As the economy changes, as it goes up and down, there is now a backlash, and we see the passage by Congress of one of the very first immigration bills. It is known specifically as the Chinese Exclusion Act. That's what it was called. And as you might imagine, the purpose of that act was to find ways to kick the Chinese out of the country. We now didn't want them. When we needed them, we brought them in, help us build our railroad. When we were done with them, we then vilify them and we proceed to want to kick them out. That is the pattern of our immigration history through the past 160 years, bringing people in, kicking them out. Shortly after the 1882 passage of the Chinese Exclusion Act, we saw Congress then pass several more immigration acts that led up to 1891, when Congress passed an immigration act that created the Immigration Service. That Immigration Service was initially placed within the Treasury Department. And the reason Congress did that was because it viewed immigration not as a people control issue, it viewed it as an economic issue. And so it put it in Treasury because this had to do with the economic development of the United States. That law also authorized the first employment of immigration agents. And Congress, in its creation of the Immigration Service, instructed the Treasury Department to tell the Immigration Service that they were to be about the following work. To prescribe rules for inspection along the border of Canada, British Columbia, and Mexico so as not to obstruct or unnecessarily delay, impede, or annoy passengers in ordinary travel between these countries and the United States. Stop and listen. Congress told the Treasury Department that as it evolved the Immigration Service that one of their jobs was to prescribe inspections that would not obstruct, unnecessarily delay, impede, or annoy passengers in ordinary travel between the United States. If you go to the border today, immigration obstructs, necessarily delays, impedes, and I can absolutely assure you, annoys everybody in the normal business of entering and exiting the United States. You have people tell you when they cross over, how long did it take? Today it took three hours. Some days it only took an hour and people are really joyful that it only took an hour to cross over. Shortly thereafter, immigration proceeds to actually begin to hire the 180 agents for which Congress budgeted. And the distribution of those agents were that 119 of them were assigned to Ellis Island in New York to help with the processing of immigrants that were entering the United States through New York. 60 of them were distributed along the border in the north and in other places in the United States. On the United States-Mexico border, they made the decision that it was sufficient to assign one agent to patrol the entire U.S.-Mexico border. Six years later, they came to the conclusion that one agent was probably not enough, so they increased it to four agents, okay? In 1903, the immigration service was moved from the Treasury Department to Commerce and Labor. 
again, indicative that Congress viewed immigration primarily in terms of economic terms, not in terms of people control. In 1907, the Immigration Service was instructed to look at the migration of people coming in through Mexico from other countries, people that were using Mexico to travel and come into the United States. And as a result of that study, the Immigration Service moved to define immigrants in terms of being legitimate or illegitimate immigrants. Illegitimate immigrants were people that came from Syria, from Japan, from Greece, Middle Eastern countries, Legitimate immigrants were those that came from Mexico. It was also at that time that the United States began to document arrivals through its borders, and it implemented an import fee to come into the United States, a fee that came to be known as a head tax. You need to understand that that only happened. Records of people entering the United States were only taken if you actually came in through a port of entry. You only paid the tax if you came in through a port of entry. If you didn't have the money, you simply came around the ports of entry. There was no border patrol. They didn't come chasing you. They didn't detain you. They didn't deport you. You just didn't pay the tax. It wasn't about trying to control people. It was about economics. Then comes World War I. Millions of people join the military and go off to do military service fighting the war in Europe. There was a shortage of labor in the United States. What did we do? We turned around to Mexico and said, bring in your people to help make up for the labor shortage. It was during this time that the Arizona Grow Cotton Growers Association proceeded to spend one half million dollars recruiting people from Mexico to come to Arizona to work in the cotton fields of Arizona. Isn't that quite an irony that today Arizona has become famous for its immigration law that is so clearly anti-immigrant? A half million dollars in 1919 would be millions of dollars in today's dollars in 2011. And yet, that's what they did. They spent all that money to bring immigrants to work in the cotton agricultural industry of Arizona. What happens in 1929? The stock market crashes, and so we now go back to the pendulum and we blame the immigrant for the stock market. You are responsible for the crash of the stock market, and so now start the deportation. You are the ones to blame. You are the bad guys in this. If it wasn't for you, and so out of the country, and so we deport them. When we need you, when World War I comes, come on in, come help us, work for us. Arizona pays to bring people in. When the economy gets difficult, get out of the country. You're the one that is at fault. And so you had these massive deportations. The Great Depression sets in. The 30s begin to come to an end. Hitler comes to power in Germany, and we enter World War II. 16 million U.S. residents and citizens in the armed forces of the United States fighting in different theaters, massive labor shortages. What do we do? Mexico, send in your people. We need you in agriculture. We need you in other areas. Send in your people. The Bracero program is established to systematically bring in large numbers of Mexicans to work in the United States. At that time, if you crossed the river, legally or not, if you went into an army recruiting station and said, I want to join the army, the, the recruiter would say, if you join the army, I will give you citizenship. If you come fight for us, I will give you citizenship. We need you that badly. 